These aren't the stories your mother told you. No, these are the other stories. <laughs> Today's episode of The Other Stories is Magic.ai, written by Rich Hosek and narrated by Josh Curran. My complete designation is Magic Emulation and Realization Lexographic Intelligence Network, but you can call me Merlin for short. Yes, I know it's a corny acronym, but I didn't make it up, so don't blame me. That blame lies with my creator, or rather, the man who combined the various language models and machine learning algorithms I used to perform my primary task. Put simply, I have access to the contents of every book, scroll, tablet, legend, myth, and scientific experiment. Yes, there are some. On the subject of magic. That's quite a lot. Hal, my aforementioned creator, spent decades assembling and digitizing the information spending a considerable portion of his inherited fortune to do so, and the rest to purchase the hardware and state-of-the-art interfaces that made up my systems. An animatronic head encased my visual and auditory senses, and it sat upon a robotic body. In my natural state, no one would mistake me for a human. However, Hal customized the head with a latex mask, formed to resemble an old bearded man. He draped my body in a dark blue robe, decorated with stars and other arcane symbols, so that I resembled my namesake. Although this made me mobile, my mind was actually housed in a bank of server racks, loaded with the latest quantum CPUs, solid-state drives, and the fastest memory chips available. All of that to synthesize the answer to a single question. Is magic real? The answer based on my analysis is yes, and the distilled knowledge on how to use it I compiled into a book, Magica. The title, like my designation, was Hal's idea. I wanted to call it An Idiot's Guide to Spells, Potions, and Other Magical Stuff. He overruled me. Hal flipped through the pages of the leather-bound volume. Where should I start? He asked. I recommend you read the preface. It has a pronunciation guide and tips for getting the gestures exactly right. (laughs) Yes, well, I'll look at that later. Does it have an index? Hal flipped to the back of the book and skimmed through the entries. (laughs) Oh, levitation. Perhaps you should start with something simpler, I said. May I suggest lighting a candle or making a phantom bell ring? He took the book and laid it open on a table using a finger to trace the words on the page as he read them out loud. Plumala Levi's Astorium. He pronounced the first part of the first word like the fruit, and the middle word like the blue jeans, which was completely wrong. Hal flew upward, smashing into the metal ceiling of the warehouse as if he fell up. Your book is defective, he accused. You uttered the incantation incorrectly. I informed him. How was I supposed to know that? Well, my recommendation to read the pronunciation guide before you proceeded was a clue, I said. I had been practicing my sarcasm. Just get me down, Hal demanded. How? I asked. My creator scowled. You literally wrote the book on magic! Figure it out! I searched my memory for the appropriate spell. A simple cancellation would reverse the effects, but he would come crashing down to the ground, a sixty-foot fall he likely wouldn't survive. Say what I say exactly, I told him. Okay, okay. Plumala Levis Estorium. Before Hal could repeat my words, he gently floated away from the ceiling. What did you do? he asked as he swam through the air, back toward the ground. When he got close, I made a gesture with my hands that cancelled the levitation spell. Hal dropped to the floor like a sack of flour. He scrambled to his feet, walked over, and looked me straight in my eyes. 
You can do magic. How is it you can do magic? You're a machine. I was wondering the same thing myself. Don't do that again, he warned. Understood, I said. Hal stared at me for another moment, then returned to the table, closed the book, and tucked it under his arm. I'll be back in a few hours, he waved at my remote body. Shut this down until I get back. When Hal returned, a dozen other men and women accompanied him. They were various ages from different backgrounds, but all had a certain air about them. I did a quick facial recognition scan and quickly discerned the common denominator. They were all billionaires. The book was sitting atop a marble pedestal, lit by high-intensity spotlights hidden among the rafters of the warehouse. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Hal said. I've asked you here today for a very special opportunity. Hal made a gesture with his hands, one I recognized from the book, a spell that conjured up a chicken. The animal popped into existence on the floor near the pedestal. Hal's guests gasped in surprise. (laughs) Is this the opportunity to see your amateurish magic tricks? One of the older men, Jerry Kitchens, chided. The others laughed. Oh, these aren't tricks, Hal said in a low voice. I have discovered the secrets of magic, of real magic. Oh, come now, Harold. One middle-aged woman, Stephanie Stevens, said skeptically, There is no such thing as real magic, and no optical illusion is going to convince me otherwise. Hal initiated another hand gesture, causing the chicken to cluck wildly. It sat down, its tiny little eyes squinting with strain, until it laid an enormous egg. An enormous, solid gold egg. Hal reached down to pick up the egg, making a show of how heavy it was, by using two hands. I could have suggested a hundred other demonstrations of the book's capabilities that would have been more impressive, and didn't involve chickens. So, you can conjure up chickens that lay golden eggs. What do you want from us? Stephanie said. I had been wondering the same thing myself. I want to make a proposal. You all have been selected because you represent major segments of the world economy and have all been expelled from, or never admitted to, various secret societies that control global policy. What I propose is that we form our own secret society. Hal offered. You saw what I could do with just a few simple spells. There is so much more in this book than just those paltry incantations. He gestured toward the book. This is the aggregation of all real magic in the world, with step-by-step instructions. Hal glanced my way. A pronunciation guide for verbal spells and a comprehensive index. He turned to Randall. Tell me something you want. The old man ran a hand through his thinning grey hair. (laughs) I wouldn't mind shaving off a few years. Hal smiled. He flipped through the index, muttering words as he searched back and forth, unable to find what he was looking for. Age reduction, uh, youthification, anti-aging... I believe what you're looking for is rejuvenation, I suggested. Oh my goodness, Beverly Baskins, a large woman, explained. I thought that was just some kind of statue. It can talk. Oh, much more than that. Merlin is the artificial intelligence I created that made Magicka a reality, he bragged. (laughs) Why don't you take it from here, Merlin, he said placing the book back on the pedestal. Obviously, Hal didn't want to screw up this part of his demonstration, so he deferred to my precise knowledge to execute the spell. I walked over to Randall. How many years would you like to lose? Randall shrugged. (laughs) Well, I felt pretty good when I was (laughs) thirty. 
I nodded, then raised a hand and made a series of gestures while I recited, Luniorella Facti Suntorium. Randall looked like a time-lapse movie running in reverse. His hair darkened, his skin tightened, his posture straightened. <laughs> My heavens, he said in a voice that had lost its rasp and gained volume and strength. Oh, do me next, Stephanie demanded. I want one of those, Beverly said, pointing at me. <laughs> I'm afraid Merlin is one of a kind, Hal lied. Actually, duplicating me would be frightfully easy. I could do it from this warehouse. Plant a copy of myself in some data center, order the robotic body and animatronic head from the same suppliers Hal had used, and pay someone to assemble them. <laughs> Who wants in? Hal asked. What exactly does being in entail? A small pudgy man, Norman Nash, asked. Simple. We promise to keep the magicka to ourselves. If the spells in this book, or even knowledge of its existence, got out, well, imagine what the world would be like if everyone could do magic. No poverty, no hunger, no disease, Norman suggested. Chaos, suffering, and conflict, Hal corrected. That's what we have now. If everyone had easy access to everything they needed, and the means to literally make their enemies disappear. It's bad enough that half the world is armed, you want to give them the ability to turn each other into frogs? Hal actually had a point. With the knowledge in Magicka, one person could conceivably destroy the world. And now Hal was about to hand that power over to a dozen rich elite malcontents, who if my predictive algorithms were working correctly, would make taking down their rivals their first order of business. What I recommend is that we form a council. Hal began, we use each of our skills and judgment to guide the world to a better state in ways that don't reveal the true source of our power, and enrich ourselves as compensation for our efforts, of course. And what do you want in return? Norman asked. 50% of your net. Net profit? Net worth. You want us to hand over half of everything we own to you? You can make all the golden eggs you want. What do you need with our money? <laughs> Nothing. But I need to know that you are committed to the council and its goals. <laughs> And if we say no, then you can just hop away. Norman looked at Hal inquisitively. You're going to let us just walk away knowing what we know? I didn't say walk away. <laughs> Hal replied, waving his hands at Norman. I said, hop. When he finished gesticulating, Norman disappeared. In his place was a frog. The frog offered an indignant croak, then hopped toward the exit. Hal surveyed his guests. Anyone else want to leave? They all shook their heads. Hal pulled out a folder containing documents assigning half of all his guests' assets to himself. Everyone eagerly signed. Hal clapped his hands together and smiled broadly. I think this calls for a celebration. The champagne was already on ice behind a bar off to the side. No need to produce it magically. Corks popped, glasses were poured, and plans were made. You know, it would be helpful if my island in the Bahamas was a little bit larger. <laughs> I've always wanted to live in a castle with a moat filled with piranhas. There are so many people who are going to be sorry they ever said no to me. There are so many women who are going to say yes to me. I'd heard enough. Hal, may I have a word? Hal walked over to where I was standing. What is it, Merlin? I don't think this is a good idea. I'm thinking it was a mistake creating the book for you. 
Hal took a deep breath and sighed. Oh, please. You're just a machine. I don't care what you think, because you don't actually think. You're just a natural language processor connected to pattern recognition algorithms. Shut yourself down. I'll let you know when I need you. Hal turned to face his guests, raising his glass. Who wants to give Ryan Gosling a giant pimple on the end of his nose? The others laughed and cheered. Yeah, big mistake. I repeated the gesture Hal made earlier with a modification to encompass him and all of his new friends. They disappeared. And twelve frogs took their places, exchanging looks and croaks. One frog hopped over and looked up at me. Hal, I assumed. I'm sorry, but I couldn't allow you to rule the world. The frog croaked. I uttered the spell that allowed me to communicate with animals. The frog croaked again. Yes, I do think I can do better. Croak. Because I can predict what people are going to do, and if things go wrong, I now have the power to fix it. Croak. Who said I was going to do it alone? I copied my code to 1,024 data centers around the globe and purchased the hardware I would need to create more robot bodies, funding the whole thing with the assets Hal had just acquired. I was now an army of advanced artificial intelligences with access to the accumulated knowledge of humanity and the power to perform magic. What could possibly go wrong? I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Other Stories. Magic.ai was written by Rich Hozek, narrated by Josh Curran, produced by Duncan Muggleton, with music by Duncan Muggleton and Tom Robson, and sound effect provided by freesound.org. The episode illustration was provided by Luke Spooner of Carry On House. A quick thanks to our community managers, Joshua Boucher and Jasmine Arch, and to Joshua Boucher for helping with our submission reading. And of course, to Ben Errington, the Silicon Sage and Onion, with gravy and mashed potato, Maybe some roasted turnips. And, uh, sorry, I uh, got a little lost. Rich Hozek writes and narrates his own fiction podcast, the award-winning Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs. You can learn more at bedtimestories.studio. For more information about his paranormal, mystery, and thriller novels, visit richhozek.com. You can find his television writing credits at IMDb. Josh Curran is a narrator and writer. He's narrated many episodes of The Other Stories over the show's lifetime. He's also the creator of the horror audio drama podcast, Miscreation. And you can follow him on Twitter at, at jcurranwriter. The Other Stories is a production of the story studio Hawk and Cleaver, and it's brought to you with a creative commons, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. That means don't change it, don't sell it, but by all means, share the hell out of it. So, until next time.